Welcome. My name is Kate Harmon. I'm the Director of Cross-Campus Engagement for the Lundquist Center for Entrepreneurship. And today on our Getting Ahead series, I'm excited to have with us Michael Jones. Michael is the CEO of Science, which is a startup studio and venture capital firm based in Southern California. So welcome, Michael. Um, I thought we would uh, get right into sort of an overview of your career. If you can sort of think back to um, and, get, and give us an idea of what you studied at college at the University of Oregon, tell us a little bit about what your mindset at that time, what did you hope to, to do with your life, and then kind of walk us up through your career, um, which was very, it has been very extensive um, up until your current role at Science. Happy to. Um, so I, uh, I enrolled and attended the uh, University of Oregon starting in 1993. Um, I was originally admitted into what was then called the International College that was a mix of business and international studies. Um, you know, prior to my time in college, I had always done kind of that standard kind of high school grade entrepreneurship, selling, you know, books and magazine subscriptions and various fundraisers. Um, when I entered the university, I um, was really fortunate that in the, in the early part of my freshman year, I met my now wife. So we've been together for a long time, um, which has just been incredible. And um, when I originally went into college, um, you know, I wasn't really sure exactly what to focus in on, but I did love business. And um, at that point, I also really loved computers and I loved technology. And so uh, the very early stages of the university, I was in the international college, and then I picked up a job at the University Computing Center um, selling computers to students and servicing computers to students. And uh, what's funny is a few of my, um, you know, first companies were founded by people that I met at the University Computing Center. It's just funny. That's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, the campus became, in a, in a certain sense, my little micro ecosystem to, to test and build business ideas. So, um, I, uh, I had my first year, my freshman year, which was great. Um, my sophomore year, my wife, my now wife, my then girlfriend got accepted into an internship in Washington, D.C., and I decided I just couldn't possibly be without her. So I uh, also got an internship with a, a senator from Oregon and, um, and, then, uh, and then worked in Washington, D.C. For, for about a, a semester or a quarter, I'm not sure. Uh, and then when I came back from D.C., um, I remembered that in Washington, D.C., there happened to be this really cool magazine. Um, this tiny little street kind of zine would be, it was considered like a little micro magazine that talked about the kind of politics of kind of youth culture in Washington, D.C. And I'd kind of fallen in love with it. And um, when I came back to the University of Oregon, it happened to be that I, uh, I was still friends with most of my team that worked with me on the high school yearbook of all things. And so uh, many of my, you know, kind of fellow leaders in, in our high school yearbook um, were at University of Oregon with me. And I came to, you know, brought them all together and I said, hey, I think we should start a magazine. Um, you know, I think today if you were doing it, you wouldn't start a magazine. You'd probably start a mobile app or you'd start a website or you'd start a blog or you'd start a podcast. But, you know, at that point in time, you know, these kind of like little, you know, fringe culture magazines were really fun. And, uh, and it was a really neat way for kind of youth to express themselves. And so we assembled a, a very small team. And in, uh, in that sophomore year, we launched what was originally called X Magazine. That was uh, originally just a freely distributed magazine that we distributed throughout the campus and supported it through ad sales from local businesses in Eugene. Interesting, really interesting. Uh, I know that Elixir went on to, um, you, you ended up scaling it and, and you served yourself as editor in chief of the magazine. You scaled it to national, national distribution um, through huge giant um, retail outlets like Tower Records and Barnes and Nobles. Um, how were you able to scale a, a magazine that, you know, you originally just created for the University of, of Oregon campus? Like what was yeah. your process in, in being able to scale that? Yeah, it's, it, it's fun. It, it all happened very organically. I think, um, you know, what, what was interesting about that moment in time for me, and I think it's very true even now, was that you know, the, the spirit behind it was just f friends having fun together, um, asking ourselves whether we could actually build something, whether, you know, finding that pleasing moment when we'd walk into a local cafe and someone was actually reading our content, um, you know, and just connecting with the consumer that way. And that was just exciting for us. So it was a very genuine, honest, you know, innocent, you know, entrance into entrepreneurship for me. Um, 
eventually we changed the name to Elixir and we um, somehow, I, you know, I, I feel like what we would do is we would go into Tower Records and, uh, and, and uh, Virgin bookstores and these different like big outlets, Barnes and Noble. And I think we actually just leave our magazines on the magazine shelves at one point just to like pretend we were like a commercially viable magazine. But then eventually, somehow, you know, we got in touch with a distributor. And I don't think at that point we even knew what a distributor was, you know, and we convinced them or they convinced us or whatever to, you know, syndicate our magazine and ship it all over the country into these little micro bookstores. And I don't even know how much we were paid for it. I mean, at that point, again, like the, it was the thrill of thinking that we had made something that went out into the world that people were using and consuming. And I do remember I had an amazing moment where I was visiting some family back East. I was in New York city and I went into this bookstore and it, with my you know, girlfriend, wife now, and we found our magazine you know, on the shelves. Wow. And we were in the airport and we saw our magazine on the shelf and we were like, Oh my God, this is crazy. Like, how did this happen? And at this point we were, I mean, it was, you know, we, we were literally being supported by, you know, our top advertisers at that point was like Eugene, Oregon's paintball palace and uh, you know, Les's barbershop and big town hero. Like these were our primary advertisers. Um, we started, you know, reaching out to national advertisers and we actually did start um, getting into actual brands, but Again, it was a very organic experience of just friends having fun, creating something together. And again, because of the resources of the campus, which like I kind of can't, you know, I can't underestimate, like there was a lot there for us because we had a fully functional computer lab, we had a big printing department. We ended up working with obviously bigger printers to actually print the full print runs. You know, I ended up meeting people through the computing center that really understood using software, using technology to help build the magazine. We had a writing department we worked with, there were people in photography. So suddenly I looked at this campus and I was like, oh my gosh, it's like all this free labor. Like we can just go find talented people that haven't quite, you know, we haven't quite, you know, started their careers and we can go and help them, you know, experiment with things. Um, and so, you know, so that magazine really was one of the first kind of true entrepreneurship experience of mine and probably still one of the most genuine. That's, that's awesome. And do I understand that you were able to even work on, continue it beyond um, graduation for a while? And, and were you also um, transitioning it to like online as well? Well, that was the, yeah. So that was kind of the second phase. So if we think about it in chapters, the second chapter for me was, you know, the rise of the web. And so remember, you know, the, when I was at University of Oregon, it was right when the web become, was becoming the web. And um, because I was in the computing center, um, I was surrounded by a whole bunch of, you know, engineers and programmers. And at that point, they needed someone to build a website. And no one really knew how because HTML as a language was really new. And so I raised my hand and said, like, that I'll build this website for us, right? And so the computing center, again, and, you know, I still dream of my office back at the computing center because I'm so proud, you know, as like a sophomore junior to have a private office in the university's computing center. Um, but, uh you know, I, I basically just, you know, became a self-taught programmer there and created an entire community around me um, of other technologists. Um, and that was super exciting. And so at that point, we did bring the web, you know, or the magazine into the web, which was super exciting. And, um, and then, uh, you know, as I started, you know, getting closer to graduation, I wanted to kind of formalize this into a business. And so what I did at that point was I rented a warehouse in, um, on Blair Street which was like a kind of a downtrodden portion of Eugene at that point. And um, we graffitied the inside of the warehouse and made it this like really cool space. And we allowed these like designers and freelancers to go in there. And I said, oh, boom, like we have a creative agency. Now we're a creative agency. And we kind of ran the mag magazine out of there. But then I started kind of transitioning from focused on the magazine to actually building what became my next, my, my next real company which happened to be called PBJ Media, or uh, well, it was called 245 Media because we were originally on 245 Blair Street in Eugene, eventually changed names. Um, and we started working with brands on building websites. So it was more like an advertising agency at that point. And it kind of drafted off the magazine, but now because we understood how to build the web and because so many companies at that point were kind of rushing online, you know, it provided us a unique moment to have something special to offer them. That, that's awesome to hear. Um, Let's then kind of continue through your career. Um, I know that you eventually sold your equity stake in PJB or PBJ Digital Media mm -hmm. um, right. and went on to found your next company, uh, Userplane. Can you tell us what Userplane was? Sure. 
So we, uh, the 245 media became PBJ media. Um, I eventually moved to Los Angeles because my wife got into grad school down, down here. Um, we um, expanded the business to New York and LA. And at some point we had a partner and the partner wanted uh, full control over the company. And so I sold my position. Um, and it was the first time that honestly, again, like I didn't, you know, I didn't go to business school. I didn't grow up with connections on Wall Street. I didn't know about venture capital. You know, my mom and dad were Oregonians and, um, you know, my mom was a realtor and my dad was a financial planner. So the, this world of technology and equity and private equity was very new to me. Um, and, but what had happened was when I had a partner buy out my stake in that company, I suddenly was like, oh my gosh, like, that's a great way to make money. Um, and I remembered this, this like thing that my mom told me when I was really young, which was, she said, if you're going to, you know, be in business and you're essentially going to be in sales, make sure you sell very expensive things. Um, and I realized that like, well, you know, the most expensive thing you can sell is, is a company. Um, so after I sold my first company and I saw this check come in and I thought I was just like riding high and so excited, um, I just said, well, time to do another business. And so at that point, I gathered up again my founding team and um, that one of my core co co-founders was a fellow named Nate Thielen. He also went to University of Oregon. He was my friend who I'd met at the University Computing Center. He did my first company with me. He did my second company with me. Um, and so Nate, again, you know, like we met when we were probably, what, 17 or 18, you know, fixing computers in the computing center. He became a really great engineer and I called him up and said, like, look, we need to do another company together. And so he joined me for what became UserPlane. Um, and UserPlane originally, you know, I didn't understand about raising money. I didn't understand venture capital, seed financing. These were all foreign ideas to me at that, at that point. So we, again, started with kind of an agency where we were kind of doing work for hire. Um, but we, what we did is we said, like, look, for every dollar we, dollar we make, um, we will spend 20% of that dollar um, building our own products. Right. Let's start you know, using other people's money to build our own products. We'll do services for other people during the day and at night we'll build our own software. And um, so within user plane, we spent years building what became a, um, you know, a communication platform, which um, was a real time communication platform that was kind of one of the early infrastructure providers of chat, uh, instant messaging, uh, live video and, uh, and audio streaming. So we just we we built these tool sets. We um, cold called people to sell them. It was not fancy, you know. I mean, it was five, five or six of us in a in a little, you know, basically warehouse in in uh, in Los Angeles, um, and uh, and that company ended up getting getting to be a decent size, um, and eventually um, our company strategy with that communication platform happened to dovetail really nicely with the strategy that AOL was doing. And AOL at the time was transitioning to being an internet providing company to being a media company. We happened to have a lot of live activity at you know, millions and millions of users using our software through platforms like MySpace and a whole bunch of series of different websites. And so as an infrastructure provider providing this kind of consumer software, um, AOL decided and came to us and, and acquired the company for a more meaningful amount of money. Oh, but that, but that's, that's amazing. And, and you actually were um, asked to stay on as senior vice president at AOL to help integrate that. How, how was um, that experience? So it was, um, you know, I think I was, you know, when I was a young, a very, a very young entrepreneur, you know, like many young entrepreneurs, I was extremely arrogant. And I thought that anyone, you know, that was over four years older than me had nothing to offer me. Um, you know, what I realized stepping in and finally having what would kind of be my first job um, as a senior vice president at AOL, um, I realized, my God, there's brilliant, there's so many brilliant people. And I am by far the dumbest person in this room. Um, you know, it was, yes, I, you know, yes, I was recognized as innovating and, and building a great platform and being on this kind of vanguard of, of social and communication, which was great. Um, but, you know, I started realizing there's a big world um, there's a ton of capital. There's billions of consumers. Uh, there's a global enterprise that you can touch through software. And there are brilliant individuals you can work with. And I, I then realized like I needed to be great at learning. And so instead of me being the teacher and thinking I was so arrogant all the time, I switched and I was like, I'm here to learn. And for my you know, two-ish years inside AOL, my goal during that time was to suck every piece of knowledge I could possibly get out of that building 
and I wanted to walk away from AOL when I eventually left, you know, incredibly smart, incredibly well connected, and really set myself up for that next journey. And even now, when I have friends or or um, or or uh, you know, or peers that go into large corporations, you know, they, a lot of time my my suggestion to them is they look at this as as R and D, like they are spies going to learn, right? And then when they come out, they come out so much stronger. And um, and for AOL, AOL was a magic playground for me because similar to the early days of the university campus where I had so many resources at my disposal in this campus, suddenly I had so many resources at my disposal and so many people to talk with and so many talented individuals, so much access to data and knowledge. And I just really realized I needed to grab that. I only wish I had realized that years before, you know, well, and that's an awesome advice for, for anyone to hear. Um, so let's then continue your journey. After you left AOL in 2008, you went on to found your next company. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, is it Sabo Media? Yeah, it was called Sabo. So I, um, so during my time at AOL, I, uh, during my time at AOL, I did start angel investing and I started learning about investing. And so um, at that point, I was, you know, my door was open to any entrepreneur, just like, honestly, my door's open now to almost every entrepreneur. Um, I started seed, seed financing a bunch of companies in LA, um, and I started working with different private equity firms on different ways that I would kind of see the future of technology and how that might impact their portfolio. It happened to be that there was a private equity firm um, that had a, a few distressed assets, and they wanted me to come in and help them, you know, build in a certain way, recover um and and eventually sell these assets and so i essentially um did three things with this private equity firm uh, i identified a company that we collectively bought together i joined a board of a company that was distressed and i took over as the ceo of a company that was also distressed um and um it was called savo media and the reason why it was compelling to me is i realized that and and this is this still remains true and it still is something that i try to become extremely well um, versed in is that, you know, if you're going to be building products for consumers, which is what I love to do, I like to build things that impact millions of people. Um, uh, marketing becomes really, really, really important. Um, like honestly, almost the most important thing. And Savo happened to have one of the largest marketing engines, um, within search engines, um, that we had ever seen in the world. And at that point, you know, search was your primary funnel of traffic. It obviously moved to social. Now it's kind of maybe moved to mobile. You know, it's moved. There's different elements online on how you drive traffic to become consumers become aware of products and services. Um, but at that point, search was the core. And this company happened to be one of the best search engine marketing companies. And again, coming out of AOL, I was looking at this saying, gosh, you know, I would love to be an expert at that. And what a fortunate experience that I could come in and lead this company and learn from them, you know, and help them build innovative products. But meanwhile, I have an access to this fire hose of traffic, this massive amount of consumers that I can build stuff for. And so I came in and took over that company and, um, you know, and frankly learned a lot about mass level consumer marketing. That was, that honestly is a cornerstone of some of my, my strategy now. Well, and so after, as I understand it, after you left um, Zabo um, to become CEO of MySpace, it was uh, eventually acquired, was that it? Right, so Savo was um, eventually acquired and um, I was recruited out because, um, you know, MySpace had a really big problem. They had a big, big problem with Facebook. You know, MySpace was, you know, if you think about the history of social, there was a website that no one knows about, probably called like Six Degrees. That was one of the beginning, uh, you know, of websites where you would have a profile and you would have a network and you would start creating a social graph. Then from there emerged a platform called Friendster that ended up with about 10 million users before they topped out. And then you jumped up to MySpace and MySpace ended up with hundreds of millions of users, and then you jumped up to Facebook with billions of users, right? So at this point, Facebook was clearly going to topple MySpace. MySpace was centered in Los Angeles. Um, News Corp had hired um, uh, basically the fellow that was the CEO of AOL at the time um, to come in and head up digital strategy. And underneath his purview was MySpace and a handful of other assets. And so he, uh, so he, you know, reached out to me and said, look, look, I have this massive problem with, with MySpace. Um, it's a, you know, 5,000 person organization with a global footprint and 20 international offices. And, you know, they have a massive strategy issue coming up with Facebook. Um, and we don't know what to do. And we want to replace management. And at that point, there was probably only a few reasons why I was selected for the job, just to be candid. 
Um, I mean, I had done small companies. I had done medium companies. I had not done a large company. Um, I was based in LA. The company was based in LA. I'm absolutely proximity had something to do with that. I had a really good relationship with, uh, with a fellow named John Miller that was the former CEO of AOL that had taken over digital at News Corp. And, um, you know, and I had a big network in LA at the time and we knew we needed a lot of talent. And so they asked me to come in and just like all turnarounds, you know, they, they, you know, it was never as bad as it, it was, it was so much worse than they told me <laughs> when I took the job, you know? Um, but again, it was an incredible education experience. Well, I it's such amazing. So literally what you described in, in like basically 15 years, um, you were able to identify, you know, certain opportunities, certain markets, um, and, and lead these companies to acquisition. Um, I'm curious, how do you go about sort of identifying the opportunities or markets that you do? Is it, is it always based on trying to learn something new, as you mentioned earlier, or what was your sort of strategy in sort of being able to identify um, the opportunities that you did? Um, well, let's see. So, I mean, I, I generally try to do things that I am personally connected to and I have a passion and curiosity around. So, you know, I, I know that n n my, my career has never felt like work to me because I get to, I get to explore areas I'm interested in and I get to do it with, with people I like, right? And, and so because of that, I never thought about a, a, a nine to five schedule. I never operated from the perspective of work. I just, I, I loved, I loved what, what I was able to do and I would love the people and I want, I have consistently pushed myself to put great people around me that I love being with. Um, and, you know, and one thing I noticed that if I, if I invest my time in, in, in whatever brain power I can exude uh, into a thing I'm not interested in, it's not going to go anywhere anyway. Like I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring passion to it and it's probably not going to be successful. So I'm not a quantitative you know, investor operator that thinks about oil futures and the future of clean energy, because that's, that is something I'm broadly interested in, but I have no knowledge base on it. Right. So first thing is I try to do things that I'm very close to. Um, and I try to build products and services and experiences that I'd like to use every day that fit a need that either I feel or that I can clearly see within kind of one or two, you know, degrees of myself. Right. So I want to keep, so that's one really important thing for me. Um, the second is like, I do think about, you know, future value. I think, you know, if I rewound, you know, rewound my career back in time and thought about my early companies, I certainly wasn't thinking about enterprise value. I wasn't thinking about exit value. I was just thinking about what I like to do with the people I love to do it and having fun, which is very genuine and very true. And I, and I, and I still encourage entrepreneurs to be there. But now that I'm in a position that I also have to think about other people's capital and I have to think about how I spend my time, I do do a lot of calculations on where I think the future goes, right? Which also, because we're happen to be having this conversation in the middle of the COVID crisis, you know, a lot of my time right now is spent thinking about how this impacts society broadly, markets broadly, consumers broadly, you know, companies broadly, because it opens up a really amazing moment for people who previously couldn't compete where they now can compete. And, and I spend a lot of time thinking and talking about that. That makes sense. Um, a lot of the companies you've been, uh, you founded or, or involved with, um, ended up, uh, you know, rapidly scaling, you know, within sometimes, you know, two, three years before you exited. Um, I'm curious, as CEO of these companies, like, what was your strategy for rapidly scaling? Um, like, what kind of tactics or, or processes did you um, really focus on? Well, yeah, and I think I think um, it took a it took a while in my career before I understood that that was possible. In fact, I think I can quantify for you the exact moment I realized that was possible. So uh, I was running a user plane at the time, and we had what we considered a very fast growing chat service. Um, and um, I was being awarded some um, some award for innovation in San Francisco, and I was at the San Francisco uh, I was at some San Francisco venue with all these other entrepreneurs. And I bumped into this old friend of mine that ran a social platform that was, it was different than ours, but let's just say we were in the same similar sphere. And he was like, how's it going? And, um, and I said, I think it's going great. You know, we went from 8,000 users, new users a day to 10,000 new, new users a day. I can't even believe it. We're getting 10,000 new users a day. And, uh, oh, he goes, oh, that's so great. And I'm like, how are you doing? And he's like, well, we just hit 250,000 new users a day. And I think, you know, and I, I, you know, I might've been mid twenties, like 
I'm not sure I realized there was 250,000 users in the world a day. You know, I like, I didn't, it, it's like, I didn't think it was possible. You know, like it was, it was hard to, for me to quantify, to see that, you know, and what, what I kind of realized at that moment was, you know, you're, you know, if you can't, in, it's really important that you get out there and talk to people to understand how big things can be. Because if you don't know, you, 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 you really build to your own level of excitement and your own level of expectation. And so if I thought I was winning at 10,000 users a day, and he thought he was winning at a quarter million users a day, like we both moved against those goals. And what I generally find is that most people over time will actually accomplish their goals. You know, over a, over a certain amount of time, they will accomplish their goals. The challenge for, for an investor, but also what, one of the realities of that is most people's goals are actually very small in the global scheme of things. Because wherever they grow up or whatever their background is, they may not have gotten exposed to things that are very, very big and how people can truly impact the world on a global basis. So the more that you can get exposed to that, the more your goals become really big which means that your expectations become bigger, which means that your expectations and yourself become bigger, which means that you drive for bigger growth. So, you know, even now when I have companies that are like, you know, and I do it obviously in a very sensitive manner, but like even right now in the middle of the COVID crisis, I have one company that is so excited because they've grown by 20% month over month. I have another company that's grown by 400% month over month. You know, one of the keys is how do you tell the CEO of the 20 percent growing company, not to shame them because 20% is very respectable growth month over month, but for them to even realize that it's actually possible you could be growing at 400% growth month over month, right? And how do you do that without diminishing their soul, right? So um, one thing I realized is that, you know, you, there's a lot of growth out there. You shouldn't be accepting of your current pace. And one of the themes that I consistently push to entrepreneurs is if you're doing the same things month over month, you're going to get the same results month over month, which means that you've got to be trying a lot of new stuff. So, and in and, and, and the world of trying a lot of new stuff, you also have to give yourself a lot of privilege to fail because if you're trying a lot of new stuff, a bunch of stuff won't work. So generally, if you look at where I am, you know, where I spend my time now, I try a lot of new stuff and I assume a lot of that new stuff will fail. My goal is to understand why it fails so I become smarter. My goal is if it's going to fail, let's make it fail quickly so I can learn faster. And if it's going to fail, let's make sure it fails very cheaply so that we don't burn a lot of capital and time on exploring that fail. And so with all my companies, you know, one of the things I ask my CEOs, and I think this is honestly true for anyone's kind of life, life management is, well, yes, okay, what's your current plan? And what are you doing to stay on the plan? But what are the three or four things you're trying that are just absolutely crazy things that might just triple or five X your current plan, but they're cheap and fast. We're trying to learn from those experiments. And let's always be trying to do a little bit of both. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, let's talk about your incredible history with successful acquisitions. Um, I know a lot of our founders, you know, um, can only dream of, of being able to exit at one point of their life, but to have so many acquisitions under your belt as CEO and founder, um, and then also as an investor, which we'll, we'll talk about later, um, is pretty amazing. So can you walk us through a little bit about your process for when you start to be um, approached by companies? Like, what are you thinking about? And what kind of um, tips or strategies do you recommend um, a founder do in, in such negotiations? Well, let's see. I mean, like one of the reasons why, like generally venture capital is, um, is poised for that is because in, in a certain sense, venture capital and, or, and technology development generally is, um, is almost like outsourced R&D for legacy companies. I mean, if, if we think about it this way, if, 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 you know, if IBM had an incredible internal R&D department, Google probably wouldn't exist. Apple may not exist, right? So the thing is when large companies get really, really large, they really only worry about very large things, right? And so if you have a company that's making billions of dollars, for them to start a new effort that might make a million dollars in their first year is honestly a complete waste of their time. Their time is better spent trying to get a 10% growth rate on their billions of dollars of revenue. So generally, you know, the technology that I build um, is often technology that is highly relevant to consumers, you know, one to three to five to seven years in the future. 
And, you know, if corporations were better prepared, they would probably actually be building a lot of the stuff that we as venture builds and as many technology entrepreneurs build, but they don't, which is great for us, right? It's great for anybody that wants to start a business. It's a great equilibrium that allows people from any class and race and ethnicity to actually elevate up within our society through early stage entrepreneurship and development because this opportunity happens to exist, right? So it's great. Um, but that also means we're building things generally for the future. And because they're future things, there's, there's definitely things that are either going to disrupt the past or disrupt current legacy businesses, or they're going to be things that current legacy businesses will probably want to own, right? And we think, we think through that a lot, right? And even though, yes, I've had a great number of, of companies that have been sold, I've had a greater number of companies that have gone out of business. So let's just be totally frank about it, right? Yes, there's a bunch of names of companies that we've gotten to the finish line and we've monetized and, and acquired, got sold, but we've tried, we've tried way more than that right, where we've been off the mark, right, which is another reason why corporations typically don't do this level of R&D is they don't want to sustain that level of perpetual failure, right, so VCs hope that maybe, you know, 20 to 30 percent of those companies truly hit an exit, maybe 50 percent of best, but there's no case where, where VCs can have 100 percent hit rate. Over half our companies are going to fail, right, we're always doing things that are typically going to be on the vanguard, we're always surfing for that next wave, and if you don't hit that wave, then basically you failed. And if you do hit that wave and you get the right wave, then suddenly it becomes typically a valuable acquisition for a large you know, legacy business, or maybe you actually get big enough that you can go public. Makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, let's then talk to your current role. So in, in 2011, you started and became CEO of Science. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what Science is, what it does, what kind of services it provides? Sure. So um, I, I had been a, a, you know, a pretty heavily active angel investor through, you know, up until 2011. And one thing I, I just really didn't like is there's a, there's a certain sterility to angel investing where you kind of pass the money over to an entrepreneur. You know, you, you rarely get connectivity with the actual founding team. Um, you know, you get your quarterly check-ins maybe, and uh, maybe you join a board, maybe you don't, but there's not, a, I, I really would argue that there's not, um, there's not really an operational um, cooperation between, you know, investors and, 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 and founders. Um, there's, there's a, there's a wall. And I didn't, I didn't like that. Um, and what I wanted is I wanted to move into a role where I was almost teaching and working hand in hand with these entrepreneurs to try to accelerate their learning. So taking whatever learning I had ingested over my years within News Corp, MySpace, AOL, starting my businesses, et cetera, synthesizing it and being able to give it to entrepreneurs um, in a bite-sized fashion to hopefully make it so that they can better strategize their goals that I, you know, and better strategize their businesses and their outcomes. Um, and I wanted to also do that with capital. And so, um, so we set up science um, with a handful of partners of mine. And, the, you know, our, our theory, which we continue to hold on, is that, you know, if we surround early stage entrepreneurs with experienced talent, we should have better than normal outcomes. And we can save those entrepreneurs a lot of time, a lot of dilution, uh, save them a lot of money, and hopefully drive them to success in a better way. That was, that was, the, that was the belief. Um, some people would call it a studio. Some people would just call us a standard venture investor. I just think about us as partners. Like, I want to become partners with great CEOs. I want to find that next generation talent. I want to identify them. I want to take their spirit and their understanding of the youth market, their perspective on the world, I want to bring it, back it up with our knowledge and capital and strategy and see if they can go become more successful. And we've worked with over 100 entrepreneurs since 2011 within that framework. We have had a series of certain successes. We've had a, a huge series of failures, um, although we've learned from every one of those failures. So maybe they're not quite quantified as failures. We've had a lot of learning experiences. And, um, and that's been a really you know, great experience for me. And I think it's driven a lot of strong returns for our investors. And, I ho and, and hopefully, you know, entrepreneurs feel that they're more successful because of our, our involvement with our company than without. Um, I hope you can give us a little insight. What do you particularly look for um, or science looks for in, um, in potentially investing or supporting a, a founder or founding team? So, I mean, I've met, I've met with a lot of founders, as you could imagine. Um, I get pitched, you know, every day by founders, um, you know, since 2011. Um, so, you know, the first thing I look for is, is you know, I, I look very similar to the way I think of the, the, the things that have gone through my life. It's my only reference point. So I look for people that are very personally connected to the problem. That's the first thing. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't think um, the mercenary approach of, 
I identify, you know, like the, the number of times I've had, you know, somebody that's way not college age uh, come pitch me a college disruptive social network. Um, and they feel so far from understanding the actual theme and problem there. Um, it's just unbelievable, right? So I look for people that are very close to the problem, right? Um, and that can be, you know, of, of all different, you know, all different sorts of problems. Like I looked at, you know, uh, you know, I looked at, uh, you know, a 22-year-old um, startup founder that had problems with her skin because she couldn't find the right products for black skin and how she wanted to approach that problem. I, I, lo I love that approach, right? Uh, we obviously looked at, you know, a guy that hated the way razors were being sold and he thought he was being taken advantage by Gillette. I love that problem. I looked at, um, you know, I worked with somebody um, right now that's doing exceedingly well that wanted to create a safe, uh, you know, gaming platform for high school kids to work on esports because he grew up in a very violent part of Detroit and felt unsafe going to organize sports. And he wanted a safer way for kids to connect through, um, through quote unquote esports and athletics. I love that problem. So I start with understanding people that are really connected to that problem. Um, the second piece is they have to be very focused, very disciplined because entrepreneurship is very hard. Um, and so there's certain credentials of how they how you think about their life and the way that they're going to focus their time that are really really important um, they have to have really big dreams you know they have to um they're not you know in many cases our entrepreneurs they are out to prove something to the world like they are not they, they they're 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 not shy about it like they want to be absolutely number one they want to be recognized as number one they want the number one company they want to be super rich they you know they have a chip on their shoulder and they're going to go out to the world and prove it and that's okay. Like, I'm happy to support that. I mean, that drives people. Whatever they find drives them is really, really important. Um, we look for people that can also articulate that problem really well, because one thing that's absolutely true is, you know, in any startup, you are selling forever. You're selling your vision to employees. You're selling your product to customers. You're selling your company to investors. You're selling your company to acquirers. You, are, you have to be able to be articulate. You have to be able to articulate your strategy clearly. You have to get people excited around you. You need to bring that energy to them to get them to collect around you. Um, you have to be able to light up a room. I mean, it's just an important credential. If I do have founders that don't have that, and if they don't, they bring in a co-founder that has it. Um, but you need that there um, because it's really hard to go build big disruptive consumer companies if you don't have a big disruptive person personality around it. That makes sense. Um, you have a really successful track record from your investment um, background um, beyond just the what you founded and, and um, led as CEO. Um, so let's just kind of uh, talk about some of the, the investments that you made and, and led to acquisition. Um, you were part of Dollar Shave Club which was eventually acquired by Unilever. Um, you were uh, involved with Hello Society, which was acquired um, by the New York Times. Um, a company called Famebit was acquired by Google. Um, we can go on and on. I I'm curious, um, as a board member and an investor in these companies, um, what is your role as kind of giving, giving the audience a little bit of overview of how you help the CEO um, through the acquisition process and, and you know, can you just give us a little bit of background of how you have been involved with your um, investors? Sure. So, um, I mean, the, the, the our, my, my, my personal role with the CEO changes over time, um, you know, especially as their company scales. So at the earliest stages, I'm often very um, strategic and operational on, you know, product and on um, marketing and on brand and on team formation. Um, and I spent a lot of time with them and some of those are very nuanced, um, things. So for instance, luckily in my position, I see a lot of data from a lot of different companies and I know certain things that work and don't work. And I want to translate those at the micro nuances of the product, right? So early stages, I'm, I'm highly strategic at a product, uh, at, a, at a product role. Um, the mid-level of business, you know, I spend more time working with them on board meetings and how we bring in the senior staff how we obviously capitalize the business, our strategy on fundraise, the way we communicate that strategy to potential investors, um, press, press strategy, et cetera, right? And when I say me, this is true, it's me, but it's also a collection of people that are around me um, that work with me and for me, right? So it's, it's not just me, right? Um, so that's kind of the mid-stage. Um, then, the, you know, the next level up is like I become 
you know, one of their core board members, which means that my interaction with them is much less detailed. I mean, at this point, they, they have a team, um, they have capital, they have an office, they have structure around them. And now I'm working with them on a board level, which we're thinking about how do we position ourselves in the market? Are we growing appropriately? How are finances working? Um, what are things we can do to improve the margin of the growth of the business? How do we expand that business? What is it to think internationally, et cetera, right? And then the fifth stage is really around kind of monetization. Where do we really want to take this? You know, so at some point, those companies either consistently grow or they flatten out on their growth. And we have to figure out what to do. Are we buying a company? Are we selling our company? Are we going public? You know, what, how, how are we going to capitalize the growth? Are we, you know, how are we going to really make this thing go? And so my role is different. When it hits that last stage of like, we think there's interest on M&A. Um, and sometimes, you know, throughout those stages, you get early stage interest on M&A. You know, on, on the more, you know, on the earlier companies, you know, I might be advising those founders on how to reply to certain emails, how to provide certain data to people that might want to buy their company or buy their stock. Um, we might, I might be guiding them on strategy and positioning. And then I might also be back channeling, you know, working with other executives inside that company or having other conversations with those investors or acquirers to kind of facilitate it around, around, I'm not a banker. I don't get compensated to actually sell companies directly, um, but I can certainly have conversations with M&A. Um, professionals to see whether or not I can facilitate a sale. So I'll spend the time, you know, for companies like Dollar Shave Club, you know, when they hit a certain size and scale that was clear that they were probably either on a path to go public or have a fairly large exit, you know, at that point we hired a banker um, and, you know, bankers are commission oriented salespeople that are retained and commissioned and they really like big deals and they really don't like small deals because they like to sell big things. And they like to get commissions. So they're like, the biggest realtors on the planet, right? They sell giant companies on very complicated transactions with sophisticated buyers with large commissions. That's their job. So when you have a company that's big and disruptive, bankers get very excited about you and you have to sort through the ones that actually know what they're doing versus don't. And then, um, and then they start what typically is a very long process of courting a buyer, right? Which is how do we get to know the CEO of the company that we think this would merge well with or be acquired by how do we build a slow relationship with them? How do we expose our strategy to them and show them how our, our strategy dovetails with their strategy and the two things together become bigger and better? You know, how do we build a relationship between the two CEOs? So our portfolio company CEO and the CEO of the acquiring company, how do they become friends, right? How do they, how does the acquiring company CEO start seeing the new CEO as a potential new leader within their organization, almost legacy planning, right? And so that's a much longer process at those bigger deals. So certainly there's like the quick tuck-ins where you're like, oh, it's a smaller deal. It's a small business business that's going to be acquired and become a business unit of a, of a larger business. But then there's the much larger deals of like, oh, this is going to be a, you know, a nine, 10 figure deal. It's going to be a massive deal. And there's only been a few that I've been involved in at that scale. So yes, I've, I, I, I'm very happy with the success of my career. There are people with me that are way more successful and hopefully there's more success for me to come. But you know, there's a journey there up to those larger deals and there's a much longer process as it relates to those larger deals. You, as an expert in the digital media marketplace e-commerce industry, I'm really curious to know what sort of trends you're you're focused on now. If you can share um, what what you're seeing. Yeah, our I mean, you know, there's there's some new stuff relative to COVID that we think a lot about, but um, the general trends we think about are, you know, we consistently believe that there's this huge massive moment with direct to consumer commerce. So, you know, especially right now with traditional stores being shut down, it opens up a landscape where People are buying things in different ways um, and they're still shopping. I mean, a lot of people are unemployed, but a lot of people are heavily employed and they're no longer able to go to malls and stores and they're shopping online. And so for direct to consumer brands, I think there's a special moment there. I mean, our entire world has previously been set up with distributors and wholesalers and then up to the retailers where the brand really never knew the consumer. So I could be buying, you know, Gillette branded razors for 40 years of my life and Gillette doesn't know my name. And, uh, and now Gillette can, right? Or Unilever can or Dollar Shave Club can. So I still love that moment of direct consumer products. Um, we love marketplaces where people can optimize their time and labor. So Dollar Shave or uh, Dog Vacay is still one of my favorite businesses. We built Dog Vacay within our, um, within our studio. Um, we were in essence like an early stage investor and partner with that CEO. It allows individuals who love dogs to look after other people's dogs. I mean, it's not that complicated. It employs tens of thousands of people with a supplemental income. Uh, it optimizes people's time and space. It provides a better experience for people's dogs. I think it's great. Um, so any area where there's marketplace um, dynamics, I'm excited about. 
Um, I think there's a massive disruption in media. Um, obviously, people, you know, I, I don't have a cable box. Most people are getting rid of their cable boxes. That, that whole market's absolutely different. The ability to kind of like entertain people in different ways right now is super incredible. Um, if you aren't paying attention to what Fortnite did with Travis Scott, it's a revolution. It's just a complete merging of game and entertainment together, like something we've never seen before. It's, it's incredible. Um, so I love, I love that mobile entertainment. And then, you know, when we think about the impact of COVID, you know, I talked to a lot of analysts and researchers. I talked to a lot of people in China on how they've, you know, dealt with this problem. And, and also people in Asia generally who have had a more uh, sensitivity to proximity between people and social distancing for a long period of time. Right. And I think a lot of things changes. Um, I think education changes almost the most. Um, I think a large portion of America's you know, children will not go back to school. They will probably continue to homeschool, at least a large per portion relative to what was previously considered homeschooling. I think homeschooling will no longer be considered a fringe uh, methodology of education. I think it becomes much more mainstream. Um, I assume the University of Oregon is great, but there's many universities that will not survive this moment. And there's many hospitals that will not survive this moment because they will just not be able to sustain the financial impact that this moment in time is creating for them. Um, I think that there's, you know, I think there's huge opportunities on, on at-home services, labor, experiences, education, et cetera. And it's, it's something that we spend a lot of time, you know, honestly, uh, you know, not only researching, but starting companies right now. Like we've, we've started maybe six companies in the last two months because of this uh, moment in time. That, and I'm super excited about them. Um, and I think that they're something that will actually have a longer impact um, than we anticipated because COVID is opening up that opportunity. Well, I, I loved reading your white, white paper on this and, and how you sort of um, are, are thinking through all the industries that are going to be um, impacted by the current COVID-19 environment. Um, I, I think we'll wrap up by our giving, I'll, I'll say our last question here. Um, this is a question I ask all, all our interviewees. If, you um, think about over your entire career and you had to offer any advice for a student who wanted you to do something uh, to follow a similar career path as your own. Um, what advice would you give them if, if you had to? I mean, obviously you were involved with entrepreneurship as a student um, and even before, as you mentioned in high school. Um, what, what do you think they, if they wanna become an entrepreneur, what should they be doing or what kind of skills or areas of study should they be focused on? So, I mean, I, I think they first have to start with f figuring out their, their, you know, figuring out concepts they can test that, that are really personal and connected to them and um, finding out the kind of why they want to do stuff, why they want to bring this out to the world, why they are the right person to start things. And I don't think there's any, like a, a, every moment in time is a good time to start things like start, like there's no, there's no reason to wait, start, just start. You know, even if you start slow, that's okay. Um, you cannot be afraid of starting. Um, that's the first piece is just start stuff and just try, right? The second piece is tell everyone about it and have no shame if it fails. Like just have no shame. If it doesn't work, that's fine. Move on to the next thing. Like realize that any moment that something, somebody might consider it a failure, you should just consider it a ladder. And you're like, I just learned. I'm just putting a few more steps in my ladder, right? I figured it out. It didn't work out. I'm going to the next thing. Like, there could be no hesitation. There could be no thought that anything you do is failure. There's no failures. There's just learning, right? So start stuff early. Try a ton of things. You know, when you realize what your weaknesses are as far as the things that you will need to build a business, find absolutely incredible people and make them co-owners with you and just figure out people you absolutely trust and put them around you, right? Like if you can't solve the problem, find the right people that can solve the problem, find the best people. And then ask everyone advice. You know, I mean, just really get out there and get feedback on your concept, find ways to test it, right? And don't let, don't let capital be an excuse. I mean, you know, m m most of the best entrepreneurs that I've worked with, they just figure out ways to do stuff with or without capital, you know? Uh, and, you know, it, I, I've met with so many entrepreneurs that will, that will tell me their vision and it's, and there's always a but. Well, I, I, I only, I, but I really only need this to really see if it's good. I only, but really need this. Right. And then I find entrepreneurs that just figure it out. They figure it out in some way. You know, they're not asking for permission and they're just going to be on that mission. Right. And so if you find yourself having a lot of excuses, then you, this may not be the right, this may not be the right path. There's lots of other paths. Not everybody's going to be that entrepreneur. And you certainly can have a very lucrative career by working with other people that are those people and you can become part of their teams. Nothing wrong with that. Like 
more people have become wealthy through being associated with great entrepreneurs than great entrepreneurs. Like remember those, those networks are broad. So if you wake up one day and you're like, I'm really good at X, but I'm not really a risk taker and I don't really have that vision and I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm that person. Then just go find somebody you fall in love with that does have that purpose and person, you know, in that person and go and like associate and become part of their team. Like that's okay. Right. But I do think that it's, it's just about getting rid of those excuses and just trying stuff. Right. And I think you'd be surprised at how open people are to talk to everyone. I mean, you know, don't be ever afraid to cold email, you know, investors or CEOs asking advice. I mean, everybody likes to help people. People are generally really responsive. If they don't, that's fine. Go on to the next person. But, you know, just get out there and try things like there's there's no time like now than just to do, just to do it. Well, that's excellent advice. Michael Jones is the CEO of Science. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your story and excellent advice today to our audience. No problem. Thanks for having me.